Many say that nowadays the New Zealand Army is of little use outside of disaster relief and bit parts in the Lord of the Rings. However, they do have a part to play, such as this rabbit control campaign on the central volcanic plateau. Indeed, the need for an army is a reminder of one constant that has long shaped and reshaped this land. Something called conflict. The first record of conflict in New Zealand was recorded in this cave painting believed by scholars to depict Coupe engaged in mortal battle with feral native sheep. Maori and Pākehā had their bouts of conflict as well. Not surprising when you consider that the white settlers were intent on fucking over the natives, to use the parlance of the early whalers. But as this film strip shows us, the boot was sometimes on the other foot. Over a hundred years later, the problem of biculturalism was dealt with on the NZBC sitcom Joe and Coro. Two it starred the dad from Whale Rider and a pom. Ah! Do you know why I lost my job, eh? Yeah. You assaulted your employer with a fish. This. This is why. What? My skin. You got a skin disease? No. Oh, you're very strict in the health department about people with skin problems working in food shops, you know. See? The colour, you dummy. Cause I'm a Maori. But while some shows attempted to diffuse the tension between Maori and Pākehā, others, like the 1970s situation comedy Dr. Rangi, succeeded only in creating more conflict. Dr. Rangi, it's Bear. On the bed, Mr. H. I think traditional Maori medicine might be her only hope. Don't worry, Mr. H. Just wait outside, eh? <laughs> Pulse is racing. Temperature's rising. There's only one thing for it. Oh, Dr. Rangi, I feel so much better. Dr. Rangi, what are you doing to my wife? Traditional Maori medicine, boss. Oh, Dr. Rangi. <laughs> but while much has been made of the conflict between Maori and Pākehā, more recently, a far more intense battle has raged in New Zealand. Not between the races, but between the cities. The rivalry reached its peak in 1988 when Christchurch dandy Rodney Bryant lent an eyebrow to the debate on Faithfully Yours. Good evening. Tonight on Faithfully Yours, Canterbury. And what do we have to offer the rest of New Zealand? But before our very packed studio audience springs into action, what do others think of us? Predictably, prominent Aucklanders were quick to pour scorn on their southern siblings. I've always 
always thought that Christchurchians, if that's the right word, uh, are rather self-deluding. I think that any city of only 250,000 or 350,000 um, would be a bit dull for me, but, but not for Christchurch people. The program also called on the intellectual firepower of Pete Sinclair, Warwick Roger, and even Brendan Telfer. But as usual, it took a man on the street to put things into perspective. Some nice chits, mate. There's some nice ladies down here. The old mainlanders. But while many of the greatest battles in our history took place on hillsides like these, others were conducted in a far less physical realm. But they were bloody nonetheless. In London last month, the Prime Minister claimed New Zealand was vulnerable to Russian missiles. One of the most fraught of these frays took place between Simon Walker and Prime Minister Robert Muldoon. Prime now, Minister, I should thing. like to ask individual questions, yes, and I would be grateful do. if you would answer them on an individual basis. Well, of course I will, but you're not going to set the rules, my friend. This is an important matter, and we're going to get to the truth of it. Prime Minister, I, I will not, that I we will have, not have some time. smart Alec interviewer changing the rules of the game halfway through, Mr. Walker. Prime now, Minister, I regret that we have run out of time. Nonetheless, thank you for your interview. Walker survived his encounter with Muldoon, but years later, Kim Hill didn't fare so well when she interviewed the humorless lefty know-it-all, John Pilger, in a testy tete-a-tete. -tete. Uh, Mr. Mr. About, Pilger, uh, I'm not what, interested in arguing with you about whether you say or you say or what you have said. Your, your, you questions, have your questions are so leading. No. Your questions are so leading your and loaded. Your book is leading. And you have spent an entire book I'm sorry that it's, I have to keep addressing your questions. Why don't they're, they're you so, deal with the issues? They need deconstruction. Why don't you deal uh, why don't with you, the issues? Why don't you ask some informed questions? Why don't you do your homework? What homework haven't I done? That's a serious question to you. Why don't you do your homework? Feathers also flew when Paul Holmes took on Creative New Zealand's Peter Biggs over the controversial et al. art controversy. A couple of years ago we went there Yeah, well, with, I'm not interested uh, in those people. I'm asking you about this particular person. Well, now, I'm you, trying you, to explain the context, now, Paul. You're Would you give me a, chan you give me a chance to explain, I'm not please. shouting at you, Peter. This you're is, you're this talking is... over the top of me, Paul, and I'd like a chance to explain the context, Well, please. you've been explaining what you've said in the past, and I'm asking you who this et al is. You haven't even answered that out of, apparently, out of respect to the artist, who we are paying half a million dollars to send to Venice. Who is representing it's us? It Don't L. tell us it's it some kind of collective it when it's it one L person. Is an ed Would you give me a chance to speak, You've got please, a chance. Please. Thank you go. very much. Stop it Al, it uh, I'm not grandstanding. I'd like to speak, please. It Al is a New Zealand artist at the top of their game, judged by seven of the most eminent art people in New Zealand. None of whom it, uh, were prepared to come on the programme and talk about their selection. John Gow, what do you make of this person's art? It was another example of art causing conflict. In fact, antipathy towards art has been one of our most enduring causes of enmity. <laughs> Some say art's for art's sake, but this piece cost $20,000 for God's sake. The relationship between the public and public art has always been fraught, partly because we're a nation of miserable, penny-pinching party poopers, and partly because artists are such wankers. Predictably, this lightning bolt in Rotorua was a lightning rod for grumpy white men. No way is that a work of art. No way. I can't even sort of summon up a comment about it because it's uh, sort of a bit of nothing, isn't it? That's right. Plans to erect a statue in honour of Rocky Horror Show creator Richard O'Brien caused a hullabaloo in Hamilton, and concerned councillors seemed very concerned indeed. When he says, my devious character was formed when I was in Hamilton, I think, why do we celebrate someone who admits himself that he is a devious character. This is going to be very in your face, and I'm worried about vandalism for a kickoff. I think there's a lot nicer things that can be said about Hamilton, don't you? But perversity won the day, and the statue was unveiled after a badly dressed Bogan Street party hosted by 
riffraff himself. Put yourself in my position. How would you feel about yourself having a statue there? I mean, I, it's unbelievable. It wasn't rocky, but there was a woody horror to horrify the public at the Arataki Visitors Centre in West Auckland. My little 10-year-old girl, she was embarrassed by it all. My little boy, um, he was just laughing all the time, and he jumped up onto that concrete block and immediately put his hand on the male genital. However, these old ducks seem to love the big cocks. I listened about it on the radio this morning, <laughs> but I think you can bear looking at it. You're all with us. <laughs> you asked the right ones, didn't you? <laughs> But the cocks weren't to everyone's taste, so to speak. But in what appears to be a carefully planned attack, vandals hacked off the penis on the lower figure after covering up one of the two security cameras. There was more todger trouble in Tokoroa, and news of this outrage travelled all the way down to the Reverend Graham Capel in Christchurch. In the middle of the body is a large erect penis with the hand uh, crutching it. Luckily, the artist was on hand to defend the carving and to explain the godless penis crutching that had so enraged the holy man from the city possessed. And this here is the seed of life. This is uh, most, mostly what the controversy is about. This, to me, without this, there's no life. There are some things which we ought to say are not acceptable, whether it's done by a Maori or whether it's done by a church group or whether it's done by anybody. This could be downtown China, but in fact, it's the new look of urban New Zealand. The integration of Asians into New Zealand has given rise to much conflict over the years, partly due to our myopic racist tendencies and partly due to the new immigrants' laissez-faire approach to parallel parking and moon bears. The Lantern Festival in Auckland is just one sign that our racial porridge has been stirred rigorously. But we haven't always been so accommodating of Johnny Foreigner. In fact, when my mother first came to stay in Auckland over 30 years ago from Dunedin, and um, we had some delightful Rarotongans living across the road, and I'd come home from work and she'd say, oh, the little pickin' has been to see you today. I mean, she had no idea the words she was using. And one day I was in a racist argument with a guy. And it was a good one, it was a good racist argument. It was really funny, from Wellington. And then in the end we started laughing. And I said, oh, this is stupid. And we shared a beer. I bought around, he bought around. We were together then. So serious? Yep. Really? Yep. So how did it start? Well, he bumped into me. I spilled my beer. I said, fucking ass. And he said, shut up, you fucking black cunt. I said, what'd you call me? And he said, nothing. No, what'd you call me? Nothing. You called me a black cunt, didn't you? I said, no. <laughs> but racism isn't always a laughing matter, especially when religion is added to the mixture. New Zealand earns millions of dollars every year from selling sheep meat. A lot of that money comes from the Arab nations, which insist that we slaughter our sheep by the Muslim halal killing method. But a growing number of farmers in New Zealand believe that that method requires submission to the powers of darkness, bowing down to a false god. In short, idolatry. Thank you, Lord, for giving us food. In the early 80s, God-fearing Christian farmers were outraged when we began to kill sheep halal style. What happened to that famous Christian tolerance, though? That Christian tolerance is called compromise. Now, we are either hot or we're cold. We can be lukewarm, but the Word of God clearly says, if you're lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. I, as a Christian, believe that the, uh, the Bible says that we shall not have any other gods but, but the true God, and therefore by carrying on this kind of of slaughtering in New Zealand, we are really 
worshipping a false god. It's an abomination, it's against the will of God. It wasn't only how meat was killed that caused trouble, it was also how it was sold. The introduction of Saturday shopping caused much consternation across the nation. It was a civilised civil war that had some shop workers in quite the tiz. A few of us are sort of having to sort of neglect our families for a few people that are too, I don't know, they don't plan to do their shopping in the week. But Saturday shopping was here to stay, albeit wrapped in rather confusing red tape. The situation has improved, but there are still some ridiculous anomalies in what you can buy and what you can't buy at the weekends. You can buy tomatoes or lettuces at any time, but after one o'clock on a Saturday, you can't buy carrots or leeks, cauliflowers or cabbages. In fact, any fresh vegetable. When it comes to meat, you can buy tin meat like this. You can also buy ham and small goods, bacon and that sort of thing. What you can't buy, though, is fresh meat, although you can buy frozen chicken. No doubt things would have been a lot simpler if only Bob Fitzsimmons had been involved in the fight for Saturday shopping. The great boxer Bob Fitzsimmons, triple world title holder, is too oft forgot. Born in Cornwall, he was brought up a blacksmith in Timaru, making him, at the very least, a South Islander. His proud descendants still punch at the crisp Cantabrian air. Of course, he got very strong in the arms, but working on an anvil with a heavy hammer, wham, bang, bang, all day long, that even a small punch from about four inches, he can knock you over. At the turn of the century, being the master of pugilistic conflict was the greatest fame the world could accord one man. Fitzsimmons could, in fact, lay claim to being the most famous New Zealander ever, if you don't count Quee Quig in Moby Dick. He held the middleweight crown from 1891, and next, he remarkably took the heavyweight championship of the world. Not only was he victorious, but he features in cinematographic history in this first true bout ever to be captured on film, seen here when, in 1897 in Carson City, our Bob knocked the bejesus out of Hungry Bum Corbett to take the title. In those days, boxers wore strange undies in and seemingly up the ring. But the underpant had only recently been invented and previous to this date, bouts had been fought gloveless and naked, as God intended. Bob Fitzsimmons is now immortalized in bronze and ready to clip you one to this day. Nowadays, women perform all sorts of roles in our society, but in 1893, even the idea of women getting the vote had our male parliamentarians frothing with rage. It's an acknowledged fact that a woman has five ounces less brains than a man. If she had five ounces more brains, she'd be very useful here. But having five ounces less, I don't think she should be admitted at all. Absolute poppycock. I fancy a man coming home after a hard day's work, tired and weary, and finding his drawing room filled with a lot of noisy women talking politics, and the man's dinner entirely neglected. Let us picture the scene of social and domestic discomfort that would follow that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Very good. Very good. Women got the vote in 1893, but the leopards were slow to change their spots. And I can still remember a bloke, Paddy, coming and saying, have you heard the news? There's a woman has started up as a lawyer in the heart. Oh, nonsense. Oh, bullshit. <laughs> I mean, no one believed it. And we all, he insisted we go down, and there was a name, Muriel, Margaret or whatever. Oh, of course she went, she had to pull stunts, nobody went to her. By the 1970s, women had had a gutsful of the male chauvinistic poakas, 
and began to organize themselves. Frankly, I think the tremendous feeling of sistership that we have at this meeting. Male prejudice doesn't change, not in a hundred years. Who can blame then Auckland liberationists for going into mourning over the plight of women? And I mean, the greatest revolutions of the 20th century were feminism and racism. And here it was feminism really knocking at those doors and charging through them. And a society, and a small society, had to cope with it. But some parts of the country coped with this change better than others. <laughs> Helen Dash was nominated in the West Coast Sports Awards, but because she was a woman, she was excluded from the slap-up dinner where the trophies were handed out. On the big night, about 50 women and their supporters turned up to make it very clear to the blokes that men-only dinners had gone out of fashion. Come on, who are you dancing with tonight? What sport do you play? Come on, what man? Last chance for the all-male dance. No real men would go in it's there. It's all over! They take their wives. Oh, no, no, no. What do you think about the demonstration there? I think it's a bloody disgrace. Why is that? Well, why should they be here? They've got plenty to do. They should be home doing the cooking, the ironing, and all those other things that they've been set aside for. During the pre-dinner drinks, one macho coaster found all the publicity a bit too much. Brave fellow that he was, he couldn't resist throwing his beer at our unguarded cameraman. <laughs> Wives and supporters of the Lions quite happily washed up. Most women on the coast don't seem to mind male-only dinners. They say when the boys get together, they like to tell dirty jokes. What do you think about that? From what I've heard of the men um, that can speak more freely of their experiences overseas, because most of them have been overseas participating in their sport. Experiences overseas? What do you mean by that? Well, um, oh. <laughs> you're embarrassing me here. Um, well, of their trips that. Um, what do you, have you not been away on sports trips before and had... Had what? <laughs> um, from foot and another eye. No, well they can talk more freely of their trips and highlights. And sometimes there are always little antidotes and things that happen. Our half-baked history is littered with fuckwits. And whilst we've outgrown our adolescent angst towards Maori women and gays, our global irrelevance means we're still a nation consumed with contempt. In oh. Oh. In, in this, our Aotearoa, land of conflict. <laughs>